I'm Hog, this is The Dice. This week we're going to be talking about Fomorians, and this script, it was really, really long and took me quite a long time to write, so strap in. As always, the topic of this Irish folklore video was voted on by my patrons at patreon.com. If you want to be able to vote on future Irish folklore videos, then go be a patron, I guess. All right. Our story on the Fomorians is the Second Battle of Moitura, and for that you're going to need a little bit of background on Ireland before that and well, the, the First Battle of Moitura. So excuse me for a moment while I go into epic recitation mode. The Tuatha de Danann were in the Northern Isles of the world, learning lore and magic and druidism and wizardry and cunning until they surpassed the sages of the arts of heathendom. There were four cities in which they were learning lore and science and diabolic arts, to wit, Phalius and Gorius, Murius and Findius. Out of Phalius was brought the Stone of Fall, which was in Tara. It used to roar under every king that would take the realm of Ireland. Out of Gorius was brought the spear that Lu had. No battle was ever won against it or him who held it in his hand. Out of Findius was brought the sword of Noada. When it was drawn from its deadly sheath, no one ever escaped from it, and it was irresistible. Out of Murius was brought the Dagda's Cauldron. No company ever went from it unthankful. Four wizards there were in those cities. Morphesa was in Phalius, Esras was in Gorius, Uskius was in Findius, Semius was in Murius. Those are the four poets of whom the Tua de Danon learned lore and science. Now, the two a day made an alliance with the Fomorians, and Balar, grandson of Nate, gave his daughter Ethna to Cian, son of Dian Kecht, and she brought forth the gifted child Lu. The two a day came with a great fleet unto Ireland to take it perforce from the Fear Bullock. They burnt their ships at once on reaching the district of Connemara so that they should not think of retreating to them. And the smoke and the mist that came from the vessels filled the neighboring land and air. Therefore it was conceived that they had arrived in clouds of mist. The first battle of Moitura was fought between them and the Fear Bullock. And the Fear Bullock were routed and a hundred thousand of them were slain, including their king, Ochid, son of Urk. And in that battle, moreover, Nuada's hand was stricken off. It was Srang, son of Sengan, that struck it off him. So Dian Kecht the leech put on him a hand of silver with the motion of any hand. Now, the Tua de Danon lost many men in the battle, including Edlo, son of Alla, and Ernmus, and Feacra, and Turl Brakro. But such of the fair Bullock as escaped from the battle went in flight unto the Formorians and settled in Arryn, and in Ile, and in Man and in Rathlin. You still with me? The, 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 the Book of Invasions can get pretty dense. So, after getting his shiny new prosthetic arm, Nuada couldn't be king anymore because of a law saying that the King of Ireland had to be whole and unblemished, which was totally not super ableist at all. So it was decided that the kingship of Ireland should go to Bretz, whose mother was of the Tua Dei and whose father was Fomorian. Bretz was the most beautiful being on all of Ireland, to the point that all beautiful things, men, women, jewellery, animals, children, the sunset, everything was compared to Bretz and held to his standard. And you know, prettiest person who is there is definitely not a deeply flawed and problematic way to choose your system of government. Like, the, that's, that's never going to end badly. Definitely not. In a shocking development, Bress was a terrible king. He immediately promised 
crippling tributes to three separate Fomorian chieftains, to the point where every household in Ireland was handing over their wealth to the Fomorians. Bress brought many of his Fomorian relatives into Ireland, and under his rule, the Tuatha were half starved and forced to perform back-breaking labour. Ogma the Druid was forced to carry firewood. The mighty Dagda was reduced to digging ditches and laying foundations for the Fomorian settlements with hardly any food. Bress forsook all laws of hospitality and kingship. And the final straw was his refusal to pay, shelter, or feed poets, musicians, and singers. You have to remember that in ancient Ireland, bards and poets were... They, everyone was really scared of them. A bard could raise welts on your skin, cause physical injuries with a sharp word. He could kill you by just telling a nasty joke about you. Your kingship, your legitimacy, your, your, your ability to hold the throne could be demolished. Demolished by a nasty song. People feared being satirized by a bard more than they feared death. So pissing off the bards and musicians, that was a, that was a dumb move. It, it, was a, it was a dumb move. Poets were Bress's last mistake. Copra, the bard, was so pissed at not being compensated by Bress for his performance that he invented the satire. He wrote the first satire. Without food quickly on a dish, without a cow's milk whereon a calf grows, without a man's abode under the gloom of night, without paying a company of storytellers, let that be Bress's condition. And from that moment on, there was nothing but decay for Bress. At this point now, the two a day were understandably ready to throw Bress bodily out of the country and into the sea. Bress begged them for a seven year reprieve just to, just to get ready, just to like get his stuff together, work out where he was gonna stay when he left, you know, that kind of thing. And the two a day were like, you know, fine, fine, just, just shut up, Bress. Just, just shut up, Bress. But the two a day were, at this point, fully cognizant of exactly how much of a prick Bress was. And they were like, he, he's just gonna, he's just gonna get ready and he's, he's, he's gonna get his shit together and you're gonna try to take over again. That, that's, that's what he's doing. That, that, that's what he's doing. We should get ready too. We, we, we should get ready for that and, you know, kick his fucking head in when he does it. That's what we'll do. So they began their own preparation. So, Bress goes to the Fomorians to explain what happens. He talks to his father and his father's like, well, you fucked up. Like, they, oh, oh, you treated them like that? Of course they kicked you out. But look, I guess, I guess we can help you out anyway, you fucking shite hawk. Meanwhile, at the Hill of Tara, the two of the Danon are getting ready for battle. At Lop Saunter's Lou of the Lonar, he knocks on the gate and the guard pops out his head. What art dost thou practice, says the doorkeeper, for no one without an art enters Tara. I am a right, says Lou, and the doorkeeper tells him to get lost because they already have a right. Then they proceed to go down the list of pretty much every art that exists. Smith, champion, harper, hero, historian, doctor, sorcerer, cupbearer, fucking marine biologist probably. Just everything. At every single time, Lou says, I am this art as well. And the doorkeeper says, yeah, we already have one. Until eventually, Lou says, ask the king whether he has a single man who possesses all these arts. And if he has, I will not enter Tara. And obviously, there's nobody in Tara who is literally every skill that exists. So not only do they let him in, they make him temporary king for the battle. Alright, so Lu and Nuada survey and review the contributions and powers of all of their troops. The cupbearers will use magic to prevent the Fomorians finding water by hiding the lakes and rivers from them. One sorcerer says he dropped the mountains of Ireland on the heads of the Fomorians. And their druid said he'd shower the Fomorians in fire three times. 
and take two thirds of their valor and two thirds of their strength and 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 bind their urine inside their bodies, which is just that's just mean. And then the Dagda's like, the Dagda will do everything all you guys do. Let's meet here again in three years, for I am the Dagda. So Dagda fucks off. He enlists the Morrigan's help by uh, having sex with her, meets with the Fomorians as an ambassador, eats a house-sized cauldron full of porridge, and then gets intel out of the daughter of a Fomorian chieftain by uh, having sex with her because he's the Dagda. And then finally they begin the battle. The battle lasted days and the Fomorians were having a hard time of it because even though weapons were blunting, breaking and chipping on both sides and warriors were being struck mortal wounds on both sides, the two a day would always come back the next day and all of their weapons and armor would be fine and all of their soldiers would be fine and the Fomorians were just dealing with these broken up weapons that were totally blunt and a load of lads just sitting in the tents with their wounds bandaged up and just like arms hanging off and geez, this, this is unfair lads, this is not fair! Naturally this upset the Fomorians so Bress sends his son Ruadan behind enemy lines to do some spy shit. Ruadan finds the smith who is repairing the weapon so quickly, picks up his spear and throws it at him. But the smith pulls it out of his shoulder and chucks it straight back at Ruadan, who legs it back to the Fomorian camp just in time to die at his father's feet. The smith, however, is grand because the two of are unfair. They're cheaters. They're fucking cheats. <laughs> so the Fomorians were feeling fairly demoralized, so they decided the only thing left to do was to bring out their big guns. So out comes the great chieftain Balar, a giant with only one eye. His eyelid was so heavy he couldn't lift it himself. It took a team of men with ropes and chains to haul it open, and when they did, a scorching light shone across the battlefield, obliterating everything in its path. Because why not have a giant cyclops with a death ray for a fucking face? The two of Dedanon are fucking terrified at this point because this guy has a death ray for a face. Until Lou comes out, probably walking slow mo through the carnage like a fucking badass, and he flings a stone from his sling. And it knocks Balar's eye right through the back of his skull and shoots the death ray back at the Fomorian armies. And look, at that point, the Fomorians gave up because of course you would. Who wouldn't give up at that point? Bress was taken prisoner by the two a day, and they were going to execute the living shit out of him until he gave them some handy tips on agriculture. Seriously. Okay, fucking. That was a lot longer than the usual stories I cover. Um, I, I, I hope I was able to hold your interest through all of that. I cut out at least like 60% of that. The, the, the Book of Invasions gets very in-depth. But let's talk a little bit about what the Fomorians actually are. We'll start by breaking down the name. In Old Irish, they were known as Fovir. Fo is generally considered to be the Old Irish word for under or beneath. That's fairly well agreed upon. Medieval monks suggested the idea that where was derived from where, meaning sea. So those from beneath the sea. This is what gave rise to the idea of the Fomorians as these big fish monster kind of things. Later scholars suggested that the Vwer was derived from Moor, meaning big or large, in which case the name would have meant underworld giants. But nowadays most scholars agree that Vwer is probably derived from an archaic Irish word meaning phantom that also appears in the name Morrigan, meaning phantom queen. That word is also probably related to the old English word mare, which is where we get the term nightmare. This would make the Fomorians underworld phantoms, an interpretation that is borne out by the Book of Invasions, 
When Bress goes looking for Fomorians to join his cause, he goes to the burial mounds. And burial mounds in Irish mythology are generally considered to be gateways to the underworld. There's a lot of really weird descriptions of Fomorians down through the years, like they had the bodies of men and the head of goats, or that they all had one eye, one arm, and one leg. And people have attributed them to be invaders from various different countries like Wales or Scandinavia, even some as far away as Carthage or Scythia. All that's really 100% consistent about the Fomorians in mythology and folklore is that they're the kind of generic antagonist for whoever the good guys in Ireland are at the time? They're, they're, they're kind of like orcs or, or ninja zombies. They're, they're just the generic bad guys! Thanks for watching that video, that extra, extra long video on Fomorians. And a big thanks to Neil McConvera and the rest of my patrons over on Patreon. If you would like to support me financially, then you should go support me on Patreon too. But likes, subscribes, shares, comments, they are all also very, very, very much appreciated. And remember, your applause is the only way to counteract my daily chant of I don't believe in fairies.